In the wake of the White House response to protests in the nation's capital, Democrats are now calling for D.C. statehood. Here to help us break down that issue is former D.C. Shadow Representative John Kaposi. He's also a member of the D.C. Office of the Chief Technology Officer. So, John, when we look at exactly what's going on right now, what prompted these calls for many Democrats to put the idea on the table of giving statehood to Washington, D.C.? Well, thanks, Alex. Actually, this uh, idea has been on the table for decades. Actually, the last vote in the House of Representatives for statehood was in 1993. And even though we lost that vote, we're going to get a vote on Friday. And so I think a lot of people have realized that D.C. residents deserve equal representation, and that's why we're still fighting for statehood. And when we look at what happened in 1993, what were some of the hurdles then that prevented it from going through? Well, I mean, a lot of people just really don't understand that there's 800,000 people that live here in the capital, that they're taxpayers just like everyone else in the country, but we don't have the same representation. Uh, and I know Ronald Reagan said the government uh, that is closest to the people is uh, the best. And so we are looking for that local control, just like every other state, every other resident in the country. And when we talk about opposition to this idea, I'm assuming that Republicans are the ones who are a little bit more against the idea of D.C. statehood, acknowledging the fact that I'm assuming it would add two senators then to D.C. statehood as well. Is that correct? Of course, there'd be two senators from uh, the district, just like every state, one representative, because we have about 800,000 in population, actually more than Wyoming and Vermont. Mm -hmm. And so that's the representation we would have. Um, Republicans weren't always opposed to statehood. I know uh, Dwight Eisenhower was very interested in representation for people who live in the capital. That's when Alaska, Hawaii came into the union. And so uh, the partisan opposition now is something we're disappointed about, but it's something that's a reality at this point. And uh, we're hoping we can still get uh, Republican support at this time. And as you were saying, Congress is supposed to take up this issue on June 26th. And you're saying that you're not too confident that Republicans will come along to the other side and make sure that this gets through? Well, I know that uh, we've got enough co-sponsors to pass the bill, Alex, regardless, uh, uh, on the Democratic side. But I can tell you that in 1993, Republican did vote for statehood, uh, Wayne Gilchrist. And so that was a surprise to many. So we're hoping for the same kind of surprise next week as well. And I've also heard people propose this idea about Puerto Rico as well for one of them. Of course, a U.S. territory. We do uh, look out for them. For example, when there's hurricanes, that's something that a lot of people came to people's minds. Uh, when we were putting resources down there, that's when a lot of people first heard that the Puerto Rico was actually a territory of the U.S. Do you think that could be next if Washington, D.C., for example, were to get statehood? Well, I know that uh, Republicans as well as Democrats have supported Puerto Rico. Actually, Puerto Rico has had Republican and, and uh, Democratic governors in the past, so that is possible. Actually, many states have kind of come in in pairs and groups, so that's one thing people have actually talked about is that idea of pairing the two. But I know that um, the difference here is that in the district, we are all taxpaying Americans. In Puerto Rico, uh, the citizens or all U.S. citizens do not pay taxes, so there is a difference there in terms of you know, why we are seeking representation, because we already pay the taxes here in the country. And it is an interesting point, because when we talk about a hierarchical governmental structure, for example, we think of what's Washington, D.C. There's no governor, but there is a mayor, for example. So does the mayor have a little bit more responsibility, a little bit more power to deal with what's happening there than uh, maybe a mayor of a different city, for example, that would otherwise have a governor on top? Is it a little bit different of a governmental structure? It absolutely is. You know, we only have 13 representatives that are elected in the council and the mayor. And Mayor Bowser uh, actually is the person who uh, has stood up to President Trump. She's the one that got the mural of Black Lives Matter out on 16th Street uh, in front of the White House. So uh, I applaud her leadership. It's just difficult because she doesn't have the same power as uh, other mayors in the country, other governors. And so that's the autonomy that we're looking for is just the same representation as everybody else. And when we talk about Mayor Mariel Bowser, is she on board with this idea of D.C. statehood? Uh, Mary Bowser has been an incredible supporter of the statehood movement. As a matter of fact, uh, she's led that movement here in the uh, district. She's helped us, along with our delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, get this vote in Congress for the first time in over 20-some years. And so uh, we really appreciate her leadership on the issue. Interesting. And as we were saying, we should get an idea of where they stand on that. I believe the House is supposed to vote on June 26th. So we'll get a better idea of exactly where that stands. Of course, from that point, I'm assuming it's all up to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell on whether or not he wants to bring that up for a decision to make after that. So first the House on the 26th, and then we'll direct our eyes to the Senate that could have implications from this type of decision. But John Kaposi, I appreciate you coming on, breaking down this idea that I really haven't heard too much before about. Thanks for coming on tonight.